ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dunal Hernan. Uh, it's great to have you here at the Hamming Innovation Hall at Nokia Bell Labs in New Jersey. And hi to everyone that's viewing this on the live webcast. Before I get into fire exits and restrooms, I need to share something that's very important. I have an opportunity to win a bet with Marcus Weldon. This is news to him. Uh, he, we had a bet about how many DNIs would occur in the lecture series for the year. DNI, if you might remember, is a digital noise interference. So that's when your cell phones cause a disruption to this talk. Marcus gave a certain number, I won't share it. I gave a number less than that because I have um, more kind of better sense of the good in humanity than him. <laughs> and if you're very good as an audience today, I'm this close to winning the bet and you can help me win $5. It's not a lot, but it's, there's a lot of pride in it. So I'll ask you, please take out your cell phones. Everyone now, whether you think you've done it already, take them out, put, put it to silent, turn it off. Check your alarms. I don't see, very, there's a lot of you, I don't see any movement at all, by the way. All this middle section here, like you haven't moved a millimeter since I've said this. Take your phones out, please. And while you're doing that, I'm still not seeing any movement in this whole middle section here. This is shocking to me. Because if your cells go off, we're gonna embarrass you before and after the talk, just be warned. Um, and just when we were gonna do a Q&A after the talk, you're, Someone's gonna come and hand you a microphone. Just wait for that microphone to come to you, hold it up to your mouth and ask the question as clearly as you can. So with that, before we get started, just to know the fire exit are on the front of the building and back of the building left and right, and the restrooms at the very front. And to kick things off, I'm gonna invite Marcus Weldon to the stage, president of Bell Labs and our corporate technology officer for Nokia. Chris White suggested I call Doonal's phone in the middle of that little speech. <laughs> then I realized I don't have Doonal's number because I don't really know what he does. <laughs> so I've got my cheat sheet of made up facts about Sandy and it turns out that uh, they're all true which is, which is going to amaze you uh, because normally I have to fabricate them uh, on behalf of the speaker but not this time. So here we go. Uh, you know, in Bell Labs, we like to think that we're visionary. And when we talk about 10, 15, even 20 years out, that uh, we think ahead. So I'm just going to start with this fact. In 1982, which is before that row was born, <laughs> not before you were born. <laughs> he did a PhD in AI and psychology at MIT. That officially makes him 36 years ahead of his time. Right, because if there's one thing we need to work on, still now, and perhaps it's, it's, it's most relevant now, is the combination of AI and what it means for mankind psychology and even machine psychology. AI and psychology in 1982. He then uh, went off to Stanford as, as some people tend to, but then he came to his senses and came back to the East Coast. Uh, and he returned to MIT where he ended up being one of the uh, leading members and in fact uh, head of research at the world famous uh, Media Lab, uh, which I, you've all heard of and seen many news pieces on amazing things the Media Lab has done. Uh, during that time at the Media Lab, he then, uh, he did all the early work on uh, simplifying facial recognition, something called uh, eigenfaces. Half the room knows what an eigenfunction is, the other half, don't worry, it's, uh, <laughs> it's a wave function that essentially reduce the complexity of a facial analysis down to something that is uh, a few points that allow you to describe the entire uh, basis of the face. It's like a basis set for the face. So he did all that work. So that was 1991. So I, uh, I credit him with only being 25 years ahead of his time at that point. If you, if you say facial recognition became a big deal in 2010, he was, 2015, he was 25 years ahead of his time there. So he's actually losing. <laughs> right? He was 36 years ahead and only 25 years ahead of his time. And then in 2008 and 2014, he wrote a couple of really great books that I uh, recommend you all read. One on uh, honest signals. Honest signals were about how social networks actually could give rise to valuable information. And I think that's uh, been disproven recently. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm, just, I'm just kidding. It was actually how to use social networks actually to, to propagate information in an appropriate way that actually led to real knowledge and real understanding, not the opposite of that. And then rec recently, social physics, which uh, I haven't read the book yet uh, because I don't think physicists are social. But if, if, if indeed it turns out that uh, physicists are social, then, then that's uh, one of the most remarkable books uh, ever. But actually, uh, what it does, uh, 
look at is how social networks can affect change uh, and, and in fact better decisions can form. So it's the, using sort of, again, biology and physics as a basis and that's gonna be some of what he talks about today. So it's fundamentally fabulous body of work and I've just summarized a few pieces there that you're gonna hear about today and a true visionary. But here's the, the thing that's also really significant. I pretend I have three jobs the Bell Labs job, the CTO job, and the uh, Bell Labs Consulting, he really has three appointments. Uh, he uh, has an appointment in the Media Arts and Sciences at uh, MIT, Engineering Systems Division, and the Sloan School of Business. Uh, he, so he has a triple appointment. I only have one job with three titles. He has three jobs. So uh, remarkable uh, uh, recognition of the diversity of, of his perspective. And that's what we found during his day here with us is he's been challenges, challenge, challenging us not only at the technical level, but actually at the business level and even the, the uh, business model level or even the words we use about how we talk about some of the things we do. Because framing the problem is everything and if it's framed incorrectly, you can't solve it correctly. And there's nothing that I believe more than that. So hopefully today you're gonna see a great framing by Sandy, otherwise he's letting himself down. Uh, but he's gonna frame uh, a number of issues uh, for us in, in the future of sort of AI and humankind. And I hope that, uh, in some ways I hope this is 36 years ahead of its time for that row. <laughs> for you it'll be too late. Uh, <laughs> so I hope some of it is a little bit uh, in our lifetime, uh, but I think it's gonna be one of these talks we remember uh, 36 years from now. So without any further ado, uh, Sandy, please uh, come to the stage. You saw the picture of Shannon up there. I'm afraid I'm not as sort of svelte and well-dressed, but I'll try. Um, so uh, I'm gonna talk about AI and humanity. And of course, in recent years, you've had all this, oh, the robots are gonna take our jobs, and the, you know, there'll be AI that take over whatever, you know. And then there's blockchain and AI, and it's all this sort of, ah, oh, it's all crazy. Um, I think that actually that's not the problem. The problem is that we're inventing all these technologies, all of which are quite reasonable technologies, but they serve to accelerate the rate of change. Everything's becoming digital. Everything's becoming less friction. Everything's become faster. And we're just poor humans. And we have these organizations, these titles. Incidentally, I also have an appointment at Oxford and in Beijing. But, <laughs> but, <laughs> The question really is, 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 okay, all this stuff is happening. The additional sort of speed and productivity is good in many ways, but it's obviously tearing us apart. How do we keep up? And I think that involves reinventing ourselves to be something that I call human AI. So we're gonna make humans actually intelligent. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> So that's what I'm gonna try and do here. So this is uh, where my story starts. So this is more than 20 years ago now. That's me over there with the uh, famous sandals. People comment on my toes all the time. I'm not sure why. But at that point, there were no wireless networks. There were no cell phones. But it was clear that that sort of thing was gonna happen. And so what I got a bunch of students together to do was to solder together little PCs with motorcycle batteries and little lasers that shot things in their eyeballs. And we tried to say, what is the future going to look like? And we invented things like texting and Google Earth and all that other like cool stuff. And people thought it was wonderful. And then the very first thing they would say is, I'm never going to wear anything like that. And you can sort of see why. So. <laughs> So I started a collaboration with various fashion schools. This is the first one, it's Crapol, it's in the center of Paris. And I showed these fashion students this sort of technology, I said, what can you do with this? And what they came up with was really interesting. They came up with stuff that looks for everything like an iPhone. You know, flat screen, battery, radio, fingerprint, that whole business, right? things that look like Google Glass. And in fact, the student that did that went on to be technical lead for Google Glass. It's like, OK, we were inventing the future here. Um, but that's not what really surprised us. 
yeah, cell phones, all that, all good, right? But the part that was really amazing was we now, for the first time in human history, had millisecond by millisecond data about 20 people who worked together for almost two years. We knew where they went, when they talked to each other, what they looked at, what they did, how they moved. And the thing that's amazing about that is that all that stuff you think you know about people, psychology, sociology, all that stuff, medicine, um, most of it comes from surveys of freshmen in Psych 101. <laughs> now, seriously, right? It's really true. Or even something that's really famous, like the Framingham Heart Study, which is where we discovered that, that cholesterol is important to heart health. If you go back and you look at it and you say, how much data did they collect? They collected about one number per person per month. Now, that was a huge deal. But those guys could have been out eating Big Macs the whole time, and we'd never know, right? It really could be Big Mac health and not cholesterol. Anyway, OK. So, so it was the data that was the most important thing. And um, the biggest change was that we could see the connections between people. Now, we've always had you know, height measurements, IQ measurements, test scores, things like that, financial records. But we couldn't actually see how people worked together. And that whole thing reinforces this idea that we're all rational individuals and we act independently, right? Because we've never been able to see this stuff. So we wrote some papers about it. We got written up in science and nature. And those papers have become some of the most cited papers out there. Something on the order of 400 academic projects have been set up based on those ideas. It's called computational social science. It's bringing big data to understand humans and human society in this very quantitative way. And the last book I wrote was called Social Physics, which has a slightly scary tone to most people. But it's actually a phrase that's two centuries old at a time when alchemy turned into chemistry and natural science turned into physics, there was this dream of using statistics and data to understand human culture. And they gave up because they didn't have very good statistics and they didn't have any data. But today we do. And we can see the connections and ask, what do these connections have to do with outcomes in a very predictive way? So we can begin doing policy. We can begin doing things in a more scientific way than we have done. And you should go back and just sort of think about how scientifically our society is set up. I mean, do you like how everything works? Do you like how successful we are when we do policies? You probably don't. Part of it is we just haven't had the science for it. So for instance, in our society, um, most of our infrastructure is based on this notion of the invisible hand. So rational individuals making decisions by themselves will yield the best result, right? So like democracy always elects the best person and so forth, right? Hmm. Wait a second. Um, right, OK. Markets. Markets are the solution to everything. Well, maybe yeah, maybe no, OK. But you've actually all been sold a bullet bill of goods. This is what Adam Smith said about the invisible hand. He said, it's human nature to exchange not only goods, but also ideas. And it's these exchanges that cause solutions for the community. It's not a centralized mechanism like markets at all. It's peer-to-peer -peer interactions. The goods part is the money part. The ideas is the creation of innovation. Now, in a static situation, markets, this peer-to-peer -peer stuff, become very much the same. So markets and peer-to-peer -peer things converge mathematically to very similar solutions. But in a non-equilibrium situation, they don't. And the ideas become very important. Access to new opportunities, connections to new sources of information, come to dominate. And it's a peer-to-peer -peer phenomenon, mostly. Okay. Now, he's not the only one that said that. 
This guy said the same thing. Society is the sum total of relationships connecting its members. That's Karl Marx. Um, he took it, obviously, in a very different way. <laughs> but, but we can now investigate this hypothesis. Is it a centralized mechanism where the norms, the best behaviors are predicted by individuals acting alone, or is it peer-to-peer -peer interactions and deals that create solutions? Or it could be both, and in fact, just to sort of cheat a little, it is both. So today we have data resources that let us begin to answer this question. And I'm going to talk about some of my students and things. So we created a company called Thassos. It's now on Bloomberg. It shows the interactions between different things in our society. So for instance, when Amazon bought Whole Foods, Within a day or two, they knew where the new customers came from. Now, this was things that Walmart, Cross, Kroger, Costco, Whole Foods didn't know. But you can now, on a national scale, track interactions between different things. Do the people that go here go there? How about, do they go to this other place? This particular company, which is privacy sensitive, it's certified in Germany, tracks that sort of information for virtually every store in the US and Europe. Wow, that's different. <laughs> okay. That's why Bloomberg puts them up there. Here's another spin-off. This listens to the signaling between people, not words, but that tone of voice stuff, and helps call center representatives to avoid fights with customers. And they do it mostly for the healthcare industry, and they get customers to actually comply with their medicine, to take the medicine, to actually behave themselves, because they don't get into fights as much. So customer satisfaction goes up, as you can see, when you have this AI listening on the connection but the interesting part is employees love it because their job is a lot better. They're not getting in fights all the time. So this is the thing that I want to point out and explore with you a bit, is, is that social change is driven by exchange of ideas between people. And um, you know, nature, science, all these new academic units Let's explore what that means and to what extent this is really true. Because this is not the way you think about your society. You think about your society as individuals making decisions more or less independently. And that's why you all wear the same types of shoes and pants and same type of watch. Oh, sorry. Um, so let's look at that. So this is data from 100,000 people in South Asia. It's a mid-income country. I talked the telco into talking to 100,000 of their customers and asking them things like, what job do you have? How old are you? How much money do you make? How much education do you have? Male, female, et cetera, et cetera. And then since they're the telephone company, they know the diversity of people that you talk to. They know who you talk to, right? They're a telephone company. They also know where you go, because they know what cell tower you're using. So you can look at, for instance, the diversity of community communities you, you visit. And it turns out that if you plot the social network diversity, so this is, are you talking to very diverse groups of people? You make more money. Not a little. Very law-like. What's also interesting here is if you plot the difference in this graph between people who are educated, like high college education, and people who don't have high school, it's not so different. Education isn't the big distinguisher. It's this sort of access to opportunity that has a much bigger effect. Who knew? This is in the United Kingdom. In the United Kingdom, you have councils. These are little neighborhoods, governmental units, keep track of all sorts of stuff. They manage the public housing and so forth. One of the things they do is they keep track of infant mortality, crime rate, life expectancy, and GDP, income. And they 
compute something called a socioeconomic index, which is the vertical axis there, which is just the sum of those three things because they co-vary. Communities that make more money have less crime, their kids live more likely, et cetera. Communities that are poor, the kids die. Along the bottom is what I'm calling connection diversity here. It's a combination of do the people in this council, in this neighborhood, talk to each other? Plus, do they talk to the rest of society? It's just that simple, right? So if they talk to lots of different people and to themselves, they get a high score. And as you can see, they have a high socioeconomic index. I should mention that this was in science, right? So this is like the leading science journal in the world, okay? If they don't talk to each other and they're not much connected to the rest of society, the babies die. There's a lot of crime. They don't make much money and they don't live very long. Now this is not necessarily causal, but this is something you didn't know. You didn't know that the social fabric, the peer-to-peer -peer interactions were so dramatically important because we always think of ourselves as being independent and that's how we manage ourselves, okay? Now you can say, well, could I move somebody from here to there? Well, so how would you do that? Well, what you might do is have a, a town meeting, like bring all the people in the neighborhood together and talk about what the problem is. Oh, that connects the people. That makes the communication in the community better. And then you'd go see the mayor and this and this as a group. Oh, that would connect the community to the rest of society. So you'd move people this way. This is a standard organizing thing, right, for, for improvement. And you would expect to move up the spectrum of socioeconomic index. So while this isn't a purely causal relationship, it likely has a strong causal component. And I'll show you other things that are causal um, that uh, reinforce that idea. So, okay, hopefully you're beginning to say, gosh, you know, this is a little unusual, isn't it? Right, this new data lets us see things that we might not have otherwise seen. So this is San Francisco, cell phone data in San Francisco. It turns out people don't go everywhere uniformly. They go to certain places, okay? And if you choose certain places to go to, and these are the most popular stores and restaurants and so forth, if you choose certain sorts of people, places, that reveals your preferences. You know, I like tech marks, I like noisy things, I like young people, I don't feel comfortable with rich people, whatever, right? So your behavior reveals your preferences. And there are other people that have the same preferences as you do. And guess what? They go to the same places, of course, right? But remember I said that people learn from each other, they're part of the social fabric. It turns out that if you look at these clusters of behavior, that these people share many properties. They buy the same cell phone. Actually, I showed this to the a former CTO of Nokia, and he said, oh, that's why you get some of these funny sales things. They wear similar clothes in the clusters, and it's different than the other cluster. They get diseases that are similar, when they're diseases of behavior. So for instance, the dark green guys, or the bright green guys, rather, uh, drink too much. Um, other people get diabetes, much more frequently than other people. We don't know why, they just do. But if you're gonna have a diabetes screening campaign, you should go talk to the people that go to these locations. In fact, we've compared this to the way you and your company manage population, marketing, organization. So in a large European city, we looked at age, gender, income, uh, education, job type, and we stratified the population based on those demographics. And then we asked, if you have these demographic properties, how well does that predict your purchasing behavior? Okay, that's what marketers do, okay? And then we said, well now, if we stratify them by their behavior, how well could we do? And the answer, as it says up there, we beat it by 300%. 
what you choose to do is far more predictive of your whole family of, of preferences than just your age, gender, job type. And if you sort of think about it, you know that. Just because you're 25 male and have a university degree does not say what sort of music you like. It does not say whether you're an introvert or extrovert. It doesn't say a lot about you. But where you spend your time does. So you can use this in various ways. Uh, we've worked with Telenor and Telefonica to change their marketing. Basically what you do is just what you normally do, but you use this sort of stratification rather than the, what the other do, and you get these enormous bumps in adoption. You should be a little scared about this, okay? <laughs> so these are not, I mean, just to sort of be clarified, these are moving uh, digital sales campaigns, like for premium uh, digital services, from a, a yield of half a percent for an ad uh, or offer to, you know, 5%. So it's not like everybody did it. But if you can get people talking about it, because everybody in this group that spends time together gets the same ad, then it turns out people will be more convinced to buy it. So it's not just those sorts of things. Here's another one. So with a, a friend, Sonny Lindemann from um, Denmark, we gave out phones to everybody in a university, and we bugged the phones. Um, they knew that. They got the phone for free. It's part of science. It's all that good stuff, right? <laughs> um, they were happy. But then we asked, could we predict people's grades? Could we predict their performance? And as you can probably read up here, so some personality things are a tiny bit predictive, self-esteem, mean GPA, well, no, that's not right. Class attendance is pretty good, okay? All the things that schools actually measure didn't even make the list. Didn't even, like grades, G, you know, SAT scores, all that stuff, not there. What did make the list? Well, let's see. Um, are your friends a bunch of bozos? <laughs> are the people you text uh, successful or not successful? Are the people you hang out with good students or bad students? That's dramatically more predictive of success than the things we normally measure. Now, this is obviously not just causal. I mean, you do learn from your peers, but also you self-segregate. This also points to a way of changing the educational experience to be more effective, because today we don't look at this stuff at all, right? If we could somehow mix people more, maybe you'd be able to get better performance. Incidentally, we've done the same type of thing in cities in the United States. Immensely segregated by income. Poor people do not spend time with rich people and vice versa in this country. It's also true in almost every other country. And as a consequence, they don't have the ability to learn from each other. They don't have ability to have the same story, to develop the same pictures about life. And if I had to point to one thing that you would want to change in this country, that would be it. 30 years ago, it was different. We were much more mixed. Just something to think about. Here's another thing to think about. So this is work with one of the fellow Cal, uh, faculty member, Ayad Rawan, and one of my students. Um, the US does a survey of, uh, it's a sample survey, of all the types of jobs in all the cities in the United States and asks what skills are important, right, in this job. And what we asked was, okay, which ones are important for job mobility? So being able to get that next job. So what is the worst skill? Well, you can sort of see it up here. <laughs> huh, STEM skills, not so good. Well, and of course the obvious reason is, is that if you've got some like highly developed skill and you've just been you know, clobbered by new automation, you're clobbered everywhere. Right? On the other hand, mixing, social skills, the ability to work with other people 
is by far the best skill to have for maintaining your career over your lifetime. That's why we teach so much of that in university, right? <laughs> yeah, okay, anyway, sorry. So what does all this tell us about how humans might keep up with technology and how we might make a better society? So I'm gonna use an analogy from deep learning AI. So what I've been arguing, and I'll show you some more of this in a couple minutes here, is that the connections between us are tremendously important and also largely neglected. We don't do it in school, we don't do it in work, we don't do it in social programs, and yet learning from each other, having those peer-to-peer -peer relationships, typically in our data, accounts for half of the variance in predicting outcomes. That's huge, okay, that, to give you a sense. So your social context is as important in your outcomes as your genome. Just thinking about it, right? Or your social pattern of interactions is as important as your IQ. It's a nice high IQ audience, you all value your IQ, okay? And we don't do anything with it. Well, in AI, deep learning AI, what you do basically is you show this AI a bunch of things, like here we are, cats, dogs, and other animals, and you know, these little neurons, these dumb little decision boundary things, say yes, no, right? And they, a deep network of them, and then something comes out, and sometimes they're wrong, and sometimes they're right. And if they're right, you reinforce all of the ones that were right, and if they're wrong, you discourage the ones that didn't do such a good job, right? And you do that several million times, and suddenly you get this network of dumb little things that does a brilliant job of classifying stuff. Okay, that's the basic idea. And I know that there's a lot more to it than that, but that's the basic idea. Um, so, pretty interesting. Um, and the thing that's mattering here, the thing that they're adjusting, are the connections between people. These no dumb neurons, rather, sorry. No. And I've been showing to you that the connections between people are tremendously significant for learning from each other, for developing norms, and things like that. Maybe what we could do is take, you know, a page out of this book and say, can we continuously develop better connections between people, right? So here's the idea. Here's your organization. Your organization has problems gets answers, sometimes the answers are right, sometimes the answers are wrong. There's connections in there, you can watch. This is content free, it's just the connections, right? And then you can ask, well, okay, when they get it right, can we reinforce those connections? Now there's a famous book called Moneyball, you might have heard of. So what this guy did is he had a sports team on the West Coast and he didn't have any money, <laughs> okay? And so what he did is, rather than recruit people the normal way for a sports team, he went around and said, you know, look, when a team scores something, who's on the field? Well, put a little check in their box. And if every time this person's on the field, they tend to get goals, that's a pretty good person. And so we're gonna hire people like that and not by the buzz that the recruiters have. That's the fundamental thing. So they were using data to be able to change the connections and they went on to win the national title. Okay, so maybe we can do the same thing in organizations. This is not unfamiliar. So for instance, Toyota developed this thing called Kaizen, which is pretty much the same, but limited to the manufacturing things where once a week, they'd get together and say, okay, we made a whole bunch of cars. What worked, what didn't work? Can we change the connections between things? They didn't fire people. They didn't buy new machines, typically. They just changed the order and who did what. And they were able to improve the quality of their cars dramatically enough to scare everybody else and become the number one uh, car manufacturer. 
In this country, it's often known as quality circles. It's basically a self-reflective thing. The problem with it is it's not a global thing like this. It's like these guys got together and decided about what good connections to have, but they do it independently of everybody else. So if you take a, a hint from AI, you'd want to do this more generally, more like the Moneyball people. And indeed, you can use the math from deep learning AI to do this on real organizations if you have the data. And I'll show you an a couple of examples of doing this type of thing, just to sort of make it a little more real. Oh, yes, by the way, how many of you work in a, a place that has org charts? Uh, yeah, OK. So an org chart is something that guarantees that you have a stupid organization. <laughs> well, because you're saying the, the, the connections are static, right? For all time, Jeannie talks to Bill, and you know whether it makes any sense or not. That's your org chart, right? You need to continually adapt it. Org charts came from the late 1800s, early 1900s, when you had a, a company that would produce exactly the same product for decades. And of course, the connections would be optimized for that, and they could just stay that way for decades. That's not the way the world is today. Today, the org chart has to adopt adapt continuously. So um, for instance, what we developed from those wearable things is little sensors that people wear. They're like name tags. But they keep track of the connections between people. Who talks to who? Not what you say. Nothing like that. Just who talks to who. And you can make a little diagram like this, which shows, you know, these people talk to those people. Oh, nobody talks to customer service ever. Uh, <laughs> the managers send lots of email. OK, and you look at this and you say, huh, maybe people should talk to customer service a little more, right? In fact, if you measure stuff like this in real organizations, and we have a spin-off that does this, it's called Human Eyes, um, you can get much greater cooperation across the organization. You can get information sharing to go up. And interestingly, it makes distributed teams much more like co-located. It seems that the problem with distributed teams is they sort of forget that the other guys are there. And so they don't talk to them. Duh. <laughs> you know? So this giving them some feedback about who talks to who, and the poor distance guys are like nobody talked to them, it just reminds you that you should say hi, right? Not rocket science. Or this is a more recent spin-off. So we did these online courses. So how many of you have taken an online educational course? OK. So I call this bad TV. Uh, <laughs> probably most of you agree with me, right? OK. Um, when I do executive education, we don't do bad TV. What we do is I get up and I talk for a couple minutes, and then we have table exercises. Because the people in the room are just as smart as I am, right? And so you get six people at a table, and I'll say, this is important. You should think about it. And then they talk about it, and they say, God, he's full of it. Oh, but wait, here's this example where it makes sense, and they, they learn from each other. And at the end of a couple of days, they're all happy. They've learned a lot. I don't think it's me. I think it's them. So what we did is we did that with uh, distance teams. Have this online thing. And then we break them up into small groups and have them solve problems together. And we have a little AI thing that watches the conversation so that people behave themselves, because people tend not to behave themselves, uh, that instruments it. And what you find is you find that you can now get people much happier, much more enthusiastic, and uh, they complete the course much more. We did this with a, a FinTech program where we got out of the groups that took the course, uh, we were able to get something like 10% of them to actually launch new initiatives within their companies or raise money for another thing. A 10% yield on a course is astounding. Oh, and then there's some other little things. Can we go back uh, a couple things? I'm sorry. There, OK. Turns out men and women talk differently. 
<laughs> and you can see it in the data. It turns out that um, men and women interrupt each other. First of all, women talk as much as men. Women often have the idea that they don't, but they talk just as much, but they talk in shorter chunks. Oh, that doesn't sound horrible. They interrupt each other. Men interrupt women, women interrupt men just as much. But <laughs> women don't interrupt women, and when women interrupt men, it's very often positive interruptions, right? It's like, oh, really? That's interesting. It's a little encouragement, whereas men tend to say, oh, that's bullshit. Excuse me. <laughs> right? Sorry, I didn't mean that. Um, and, and what I think it has to do with is it has to do with essentially really ancient pre-linguistic dominance signaling. It's like, you know, I'm in charge of the conversation, and I'm going to give you the, you know, the baton, and, and you don't get a chance, right? <laughs> so, so we're able to watch some of that and fix it, which is pretty good. So let's go ahead. Here's another thing. So um, one of my students is from China, and I mentioned I have an appointment at Beijing. Um, uh, we were able to get a survey of all the startups in all of the incubators in all of China. It's the sort of thing you can do in China. You couldn't do it here. Um, and so this is about halfway through. It's only 3,200 startups. And we measured all sorts of things. And the number one factor was cultural diversity for creating the startup. That's really surprising. Now, in China, it means something different than it means here. It means that these people have experience outside their region, like, for instance, in another country or another very different part of China. So it's a little bit different than diversity here, but the number one thing. On the other hand, when it came to scaling the thing, diversity was not so important. It turns out it's hard to manage a bunch of diverse people. <laughs> okay. Surprise. Again, connections. This is data from Beijing, where what we're doing is we're looking at the connections between neighborhoods. So you look at a neighborhood and you say, well, who works in this neighborhood? Do they come from lots of different backgrounds, lots of different communities, or do they come from only one or two? And you compute a diversity score for that. And then you go back in a year and you ask about growth and it turns out that this diversity score does a really good job of predicting um, capital growth, income growth, uh, uh, and GDP in these districts. Counts for about half of the variance. Think about the last two things I just told you. Creating businesses and growing neighborhoods depends on diversity of connections, and that accounts for about half of the variance. We don't do that in this country. I mean, we just really don't. <laughs> I don't even collect the data, mostly, right? Sort of interesting. We've done this in New York. Same relationship holds in New York. Same relationship holds in, in Istanbul. Um, you can do things like predict where growth will be. If you're in the real estate business, you should pay attention to this. right? But it gives you a quantitative way of guiding investment in your infrastructure. So the government can say, if we have so much money, where do we put it to float the most boats that we can? Because what you do is you promote diversity between communities, and that floats the, the boats. That predicts floating of the boats. It's not strictly causal. It's complicated. But it is predictive, reliably predictive. OK. So I'm going to sort of finish up here a little bit, and then you can ask me questions. So what I've argued is that unlike you're taught in school and the standard story in Western society, um, the economy is driven mainly by innovation. We're in a non-stationary environment where new ideas, new opportunities are the dominant thing. Okay. However, again, unlike what you're taught, 
It's human connections that are the main driver of innovations, ideas and opportunities. That you're definitely not taught. It's not the only thing. But in the data that we have, it's about half of the variance. And it seems to be predictive. It's something that you can design policies around. OK? In order to do that, in order to make use of that, you have to measure things. You have to measure things like, where do the people live who work in this neighborhood? What are the cultural backgrounds of the people in this startup? What are the patterns of communication in the organization? And currently, we don't do that. Okay, So you need to have this commitment to be able to get this sort of detailed data about things. And you need to commit to constantly changing your organization. No more static org charts. right? You need to commit to constantly updating your organization. That's sort of the story of AI. OK, so having gotten there, now let me get to the part that's really key to Nokia, uh, which is, OK, so I talked about all this data. Uh, you might be disturbed <laughs> to realize all that data is out there and that it's important. How are we going to make use of this data? So I was disturbed about this and started a discussion in the World Economic Forum back in the sort of 2006, 2007, uh, proposing that, um, that citizens be given ownership rights in their data, basically. It's called it the New Deal on Data. Um, and the Justice Commissioner of the EU and the Chairman of the US Federal Trade Commission was part of the discussion, as was CTO of Microsoft, et cetera. Okay? And from that, um, eventually grew up things like GDPR, which has its faults, but is progress. Uh, the Consumer Privacy Bill of Rights in this country, which has not been enacted, but is in regulatory uh, um, structures. Um, so that's all good. But rather than looking at this as a cost, you can say, look, this is a general problem. We suddenly have this stuff about data about people everywhere. This is a privacy problem, it's a security problem, but it's also how you make society better. So we need to be able to capture use of this data without endangering individuals or society. Right? OK. So if you think about it that way, you come up with, I think, or at least I came up with, a, a way of doing this which is intrinsically Preserving of privacy, preserving of security, and it gives you the hooks to guarantee fairness, bias, and so forth. And I should mention some of my brilliant students, Eve Alexandra and um, Guy Ziskin, are, are, are sort of equally to blame for this. And we have a group of companies, you know, MasterCard, Intuit, uh, people like that, as well as a number of countries. France, Colombia, Israel, China, who are helping us develop this framework. And I'll give you an idea of what it looks like. The key thing is share answers, not data. Okay? If you take all the data and you stick it in one place, then you've told the bad guys where to go to steal it all. Now, military guys figured this out in about the year 1400. You know? They would take their army, and they'd stick it behind a moat and a big wall, and then somebody would leave the door open, and everything would go away. So today, about 70% of all cyber attacks, cyber breaches, happen because of human error. Same type of thing. If you leave the data where it's collected, then you don't have copies of the data. It gives you defense and depth. You'll lose some of it, but you won't lose all of it. Okay. So when I want to answer something, I don't like put it all in one spot and then analyze it. I figure out what I'm going to ask beforehand, and I send questions to the thing. They're evaluated, and they come back. OK, avoids duplication, gives you defense and depth. It also gives you a transparency and accountability that you don't have today. So for instance, we do this on a blockchain. A blockchain is just a fault-tolerant mechanism where you get records that are not 
easily corruptible so that you can go back and say, what happened? And so instead of this sort of thing like, you know, you put all the data in one place and you mess with it, what you do is you present credentials to the system. You present, you select a question, because the questions are all predefined, and they're actually on the blockchain. The code is on the blockchain. The person you ask the question of runs that code behind their firewall. There's no copies of data. You're not moving data around. And posts the answer on the blockchain. And that can all be encrypted, or it can all be open. We call this open algorithms, because in the case of national data systems, you want as much transparency as you can get. And if what you're doing with your questions is asking only aggregate questions or questions that preserve privacy, then the system as a whole will preserve privacy and it'll be much more secure. So, so that's the sort of system that we're building. Uh, we are building it for the Internet, uh, Inter-American Development Bank, for China Construction Bank, for moving money around in Chinese areas. Uh, we have something you can look at called Opal Project. Dot org, which are national data systems for Colombia and Senegal. The fact that you're posting all the questions and the answers on this blockchain gives you the ability to ask how well you're doing. Are you being fair? Are you being biased? Are you getting the results that you want? So you can make human auditing of this national data system in real time. So we build tools to evaluate fairness, bias, things like that, so that you can look at what's happening out there and asking, is this what you want? So today, we have all these bureaucracies which essentially execute algorithms on data that they have, but we have no way of auditing whether they're fair or biased. We don't know if our current societal systems are any good. I remember this talk in Oxford where uh, some scientists got up and talked about all the horrible things you can do with big data. And the justice minister for Kenya got up and said, what you say is true, but have you seen today's systems? Almost anything you can do is going to be better than what we have today. And that's true. What we need to start doing is evaluating and, and logging what happens today so that we know that when we make changes, we're going in the right direction. It also allows us to talk about things in a very concrete way. So um, all good, share answers, log everything. One more principle, never decrypt data ever. So if you look at the Snowden papers, you'll figure out that if you ever decrypt data at any point, someone will steal it. But that's a problem, right? I mean, how do you actually do the computation if the data is encrypted? Well, it turns out you can do that. And I'm about to tell you a couple of ways. Of, I'll tell you one way of doing it. And you could ask, and I'll tell you a second way. So there's a little hint. So we developed this um, and got comments like this out of it, OK? Because what it does is it lets you answer questions without exposing the data. So imagine that you're a hospital in one country, and you're a hospital in another country, and I'm a hospital in a third country. We'd like to know how well some drug works. But you can't share data, because it's against the law to send data out of your country. And it's patient data anyhow. And you really don't want people to know how well your hospital does. But if you can expose encrypted data to an algorithm that looks at the encrypted data only, that does not count as sharing data legally because you haven't exposed it. Nobody can tell about the personal data, about the hospital data. But we can answer questions about how well that drug works across all the hospitals. Okay? I'll give you just a hint for one way to do it. Um, it started when we looked at this fact that people are heavily influenced by each other. And what we noticed was that there were a lot of questions that you could answer without knowing the data. So for example, we looked at Bluetooth pings off of phones. You could determine the whole social structure of the group with high accuracy 
without even knowing that they were Bluetooth pings. Because it turns out that friends spend time with each other, so you get Bluetooth pings at certain times a day, but not others. The boss, you know, when the boss shows up, other guy, the people who work for him shows up, but not vice versa, et cetera. Or here's another example. So looking at the blockchain that is part of uh, Bitcoin, there's been some big fraud things, but you can tell who the crooks are. And the reason is, is if, let's say, you two guys are crooks, right? And I happen to know you're a crook. <laughs> Sorry. What I'm going to observe is that every time he does something, he does something. Now, maybe you don't talk to each other at all, but I can predict your actions from you. That doesn't happen by chance. That means there's a causal relationship between you somehow. Okay? And so I can take all the users of Bitcoin and I can group them into people that are causally connected, predictively elected, right? We don't know exactly what the causal is. And if anyone in your box is a crook, you probably are too. And so we've been able to duplicate a lot of the fraud work that, pe that took people months to do in literally seconds. And now we have a spin-off that does this for Coca-Cola and MasterCard and the Israeli intelligence uh, services. You can do really interesting things if you're looking for terrorists. Um, so there we are. Um, we have a book about this, Trust Data, um, 12 bucks on Amazon. We don't make money off of it. It's just like to tell you some of this stuff applications of that to financial technology. And then there's the social physics book if you're interested in the sort of broader picture. Uh, and thank you. I you come have a seat. I get to ask the first couple of questions. Good. That's the only advantage I get, and then, and then we'll open up. So uh, great talk, fantastic you? stuff. Uh, the other 50% in the variance that isn't uh, interaction, interaction between people, is it genetic? Because I remember reading this book called Living With Our Genes, did the Finnish twin studies, they separated the twins, and, and essentially independent of the social economic background they were raised in, they all ended up being somewhat the same in, in, in outcomes. So he, the argument was genetics were a strong indicator, not just social. So is it in fact 50-50 between genetics and social slash interactive? Well, there's a lot of debate about that. And I think that the genetics is sort of leads you in the wrong direction. It's individual properties, OK? So individual properties can come up out in in number of ways. For instance, there's epigenetic mm -hmm. stuff. So you're, you're, if you have the same mother, she had experiences that changed the way her genes are expressed, which are in you, that sure. are transmitted to you. It was a recent thing, so guys. It turns out the health of babies depends on your health also. It's epigenetic, it's not genetic, right? So, so therefore an interact, what you would argue maybe is, maybe genet genetics is the transmission medium, but it's an interactive thing. It's an interactive thing. That and, led to a genetic thing that led to. And, and of course what it involves is, is feedback with the environment, okay? So the social thing, it's not like you're a robot that does what everybody else, but that's, a characterization of your important of your environment. And it turns out social stuff is perhaps the most important yeah. element of your environment. So for instance, the social stuff has a lot of effect on the genetic stuff. Absolutely. I like I like that connection. Yeah. Uh, so next question of mine and uh, somewhat different is uh, what went wrong with social networks? Uh, given that uh, it should have been a forum for diversity and it became a, a forum for echo chambers or homogeneity. So what do we have to do to make that exchange with people uh, rich and value add versus reductive and uh, diminutive and... Yeah, well, so there's a, a lot of um, work on this, a lot of suggestions. I can give you sort of my that was, that's what I'd like about it. what needs to happen. And it's by analogy to the real world. So. Um, you need to have real identities, and it needs to be something where you're accountable. There's a consequence. And there's a consequence. Reputations are, you know, when people have a reputation that matters, they behave themselves. 
I like that. So I actually have now my third question, uh, Yuval Harari uh -huh. and his uh, focus on tribes matter and tribes have a collective responsibility to each other and about 150 people you can interact with with trust. Uh -huh. the point. Uh, there, of course, you have a real identity. Right. You are known by the tribe members. Your behavior is monitored by the tribe members. Uh, there's a, a consequence of bad behavior. You're possibly kicked out of the tribe or your role in the tribe changes. And that basically that's how we still behave as humans, even though it's you know 80,000 year old behavior. Do you agree or disagree that that's sort of the fundamental? Yeah, that, that's a pretty good characterization. The third part that's missing there is the value of that. So, so why are you so obsessed about being a member of this tribe? Because all these people mm. are experimenting with things and teaching you about what works and defending you. And, and, and you're creating your new reality. And you're creating your new reality. So for instance, when you look at some of this learning stuff, mm. right? Like how do you know what to do? Well, almost the most important way you can learn what to do in your life is look at people like you and see what they do. And this is, of course, is the original invention of tools, and you can go from there, how to create civilizations, because you learn and see how That's did right. someone put those two things so together. So the basic yeah. you know, adaptation that, is, that we call social, right, group structure, is a learning structure. Is a learning structure. Right, and that's the thing that is so valuable that you're willing to you know, sacrifice all sorts of things to stay part of it. And language is just a mechanism for learning. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So therefore, we develop language to learn, et cetera, et cetera. So it all comes down to interactions giving rise to learning behavior. Again, it's interactions between people that are members of your tribe. It doesn't mean you're necessarily phys historically, physically, you'd be next to each other. Yeah. Uh, but then the social network, the digital world, no accountability, no identity. That's right. OK, enough from me. Those are already fascinating thoughts. So over to uh, the audience. And you have to abide by the Hernonian rules at Stunel. Uh, you have to wait for the microphone. Going back to your very first slide, I think it was, I thought you were going in the direction of saying technology is moving pretty fast, but people and societies can't really keep up with that speed and causing all kinds of problems in society. C could you address uh, that issue? Yeah, I, sorry if I didn't uh, connect the dots back there. So. I feel like the main problem we have today is we're having a hard time keeping up with the increased pace of things, all these new technologies. A lot of the reason that we have a hard time keeping up is that we have these very static social organizations. So we learn very slowly as a consequence. Right? We learn just from the people that we interact with. We don't have a good mechanism for figuring out what works and what doesn't work. Now, I can give you an example at the global scale, um, which is something I'm involved in. So for, for several years, we were, uh, I helped put on these experiments where we got data from telcos, governments, banks for entire countries and tried to figure out how you could do a better job of poverty, genocide, equality, investment, et cetera. And that turned out to be very successful. And it inspired uh, the UN's Sustainable Development Goals to include 169 measurements using data like I just described to you to measure all those development goals. OK? So the charter is, is to all of the national statistical offices in the world to begin doing the sort of measurements I was showing you about productivity, about diversity, about this, about that, uh, because those predict innovation, predict so forth, and would allow the society to evolve more quickly to deal with all these challenges. Okay? Now, no one's going to do what the UN tells them to do. I mean, we sort of know that. But um, there's a finance side of it, too, which is people like the International Monetary Fund and stuff are beginning to demand those numbers and condition loans and funding based on them. So I talked about this feedback where you take measurements of society and feed them back to change connections. That's what's happening. If you measure diversity everywhere, if you measure forced migration, if you measure inequality, 
All of those things can be fed back into society using financial tools. You get better loans if you have a more equal, more fair, more innovative society. What that does is it creates a society that evolves more quickly and in a direction that we've all agreed is a good direction to go in. I'm going to add in a question of mine yeah. again. Uh, back to your uh, eigenfaces. Mm -hmm. if, I, if I have to inter interact across a digital media, back to my problem of not necessarily being physically connected, uh, can uh, I, or because obviously I recognize very subtle things in a face when I'm physically present. Mm -hmm. Is there a way to have a better interaction across a digital medium, whether it's by face or voice, or something that would allow that trust to appear more readily than, by, than without that. Because obviously we all seem to resist video communications because we, we like the privacy and the anonymity of where we are and what we're doing. But, but on the other hand, we don't get the connectivity out of that. So is there a way to combine sort of your work on wearables and eigenfaces to help create sure. trust across digital divides? So one thing that's wrong with a lot of digital stuff is that it's not about the words when we talk, right? So, uh, you know, before we had language, we had signaling behavior. Yeah. You know, dominance, interest, attractive, whatever, right? Okay. And those weren't words, those were ways of behaving. And they come across in the face and they come across in the voice. And then we layered words on top of that, but most of our systems forget that older stuff. Mm -hmm. So, you know, a simple example would be, you know, I can say, I'm interested. Or I can say, I'm interested. <laughs> there was a bit of a difference. A yeah. bit of a difference, right? Yeah. So, so if you can begin communicating that sort of older contextual signaling stuff, then you get richer communication and can have uh, better communication. And then better interaction, and off we go. That's right. However, that also gets back to this you know, you ought to have a reputation and consequences also. You really have to be members of community to build trust. Trust comes down to the expectation that interactions in the future will be just as good as the ones in the past. And there are probably there are consequences to bad interactions. That's right. Yeah. Yeah, you get, you get cut out of the network yeah, exactly. of trust. Yeah, exactly. Right, yeah. So better communication can help that, but uh, you also need the feedback mechanisms, I think. Other questions? Marina, to are you holding back the microphone there? You weren't giving it to Marina? Go ahead, Marina. I was waiting for you to give you the permission. So, um, more on the social side of things. Uh, you say we need to have more diversity of connections, but if you look at society today with you know, texting becoming the primary mode of communication, you end up living in societies where you meet the same group of people. You don't walk up to a grocery store anymore. You could do it online. So how do you see, uh, you know, even if you have collected data, that it, it almost looks like modern society is taking away that common communication that you used to have, walking up to the post office. You never go to the post office anymore. So, so how do you see that that kind of like diverse connections from getting added into your social network groups that wouldn't happen today because of our isolation based on technology? Well, so this is obviously a problem, right? I'll give you a, a, a technological suggestion uh, just as a thought piece, not that it's a perfect thing. So with uh, Esteban Mora, we measured uh, segregation in uh, the major US cities. It turns out that about 50% of the segregation between different income classes is the result of what you might call micro choices. You know, you're there on the street and you go to the Dunkin' Donuts or the Starbucks. Starbucks has a very different demographic than Dunkin' Donuts. That small choice makes a big difference, it's almost 50% of the variance, in terms of the segregation of our society mm. on the physical plane. So what could you do with that? Well, you could, for instance, have a tax, which is if you're a high income person, it costs you more to go to Starbucks than to go to Dunkin' Donuts, right? Maybe a lot more. And if you're a low income person, 
you get a super discount at Starbucks and not so much at Duncan. So those local choices now promote mixing. And as far as online stuff, imagine that there was an online tax. Right? So things ordered online deprive the, the society of you, and you need to pay more. Okay? So you could, could use a micro taxes to provoke much more physical mixing, things like that, and, and reduce the amount of segregation and the, the isolation in our society. Now, there are problems with this suggestion. <laughs> I admit it. It, it sounds, <laughs> sounds very European, possibly Swedish. Yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> but but my, my question was going to be, why can't people be educated to solve that problem by saying, I am losing something in this, in this uh, by the lack of exchanges, therefore I will change my behavior? Certainly. I yeah. mean, so um, people can be can have the advantages and disadvantages poised out, uh, and, and they'll make choices. But as we have discovered in our society. They prefer not to. Well, arguments about facts actually don't change behavior very much. I mean, doctors have known this for a long time. Smoking will kill you. So what? Yeah, exactly. Well, no, actually, it's worse, <laughs> it's worse than that. In England, they started that yeah. and labeled all of the uh, cigarette packages yeah. with this will kill you, yeah. and sales went up. Because it, it was now a daredevil activity. Exactly, <laughs> right? It's like, oh my god, right? So, so on the other hand, in this country, um, the moment you had to stand outside in the rain and uh, smoke, right, because you weren't allowed to do it yeah. inside, and all the other people walked by and pitied you, so smoking went down it like It became a rock. pitiable. It became pitiable, and people stopped. That is interesting. It's a sad reflection, but it's actually true, I think, right? So we have to sort of morph how it's perceived. So I think the answer is, Marina, it has to be cool again to go out and, and, and meet, and then people will do it as an act of social coolness. Go ahead. Yeah, I'm wondering if you could give us a, a couple specific examples of highly diverse, highly interactive, highly successful communities <clears throat> that we could use as models to aspire to. And it can't be MIT Media Lab. Oh, <laughs> That's what I was going to say. It could be say. Bell Labs. You're allowed to say Bell Labs. Oh, Bell Labs, yeah. <laughs> Actually, there is a uh, study called Bell Stars about Bell Labs, about what is the most successful people in Bell Labs do. That's a study from a while ago. But the people who are most successful um, and deemed the stars were the ones that maintained the most diverse social mm -hmm. networks. So what that gave them was somebody to go and ask for advice when they didn't understand something, when there was a new context to thing. It also gave them a better sense of what was going on. So, so I think that type of thing is uh, a pretty good solution. And I do like the Media Lab, it's pretty good. The secret behind all of MIT, why is MIT good? Everybody in the world goes through there. Uh, I had to yeah. teach an entrepreneurship course. One guy wanted to do a, a, a viral cold chain company. So this is something that delivers uh, antiretrovirals to people, right? They have to be kept cold. And he needed to talk to health ministers from uh, African countries. And in Six months he was able to talk to the health minister of every African country save one without leaving Boston. Think about that. So, so all the senior leadership of every African company, country comes through Boston at least once a year. <laughs> you, can, you can meet people, right? You can really get a sense of what's happening. So these sort of things that are a nexus mm. have a real advantage in terms of hearing what's happening. So if we, if we talk about not Bell Labs, not Media Lab, what do you see places where those sorts of communities are nucleating? There might not be scientific or technical, but might be other places where those things are nucleating that would be hotbeds of potential future innovation of any kind because the, those sorts of relationships are forming. And it, are they physical places or are they virtual places? Well, they tend to be physical places because 
um, it's implicit information. It's not the sort of stuff you would write down that Come often here matters. Come here and you will meet everyone to do with healthcare in the African continent. Right? You, you can't write that down. It's, it's implicit in the connections you make. Yeah, uh, and you may not know what you're looking for. Yeah. So, for instance, uh, New York has had a real revival in its entrepreneurship uh, culture because, of course, they include finance, arts, uh, media, uh, digital. And so they, they have a mixing that's very unusual. Um, Austin, Texas, yeah. you know, has South by Southwest. So it's a huge music area, a huge, you know, it's like, and, and so they've had a real renaissance. Uh, and Boston area. with a biomedical yeah. uh, and, and related startups. That's, that's really interesting. Does it say that universities of the future if they were a little bit more entrepreneurial or diverse and not just focused on teaching, could be places where this renucleates. If the university of the future can't be the university of today, is this a place where communities can form? Universities could be, but they need a lot of reformation. <laughs> I mean, you know, universities are one of maybe the two or three oldest business models in the world, yeah. okay? Uh, you, know, you get these these engravings from the 1300s, and it looks just like it just looks like the same. <laughs> like, so you'd oh argue for God. cities over universities. Cities are no. I think that universities can become very um, innovative, but what they have to do is realize that it's not about static book learning. It's about learning skills. It's learning how to go out and find uh, new connections. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, you know, so if you, if, you know, when I look at MIT through a sort of a squinted eye, the part that's most interesting isn't the formal program. It's all the informal stuff. And the, the collaboration. The clubs, the, yeah. in, you know, initiatives of this and the that. And the classes are sort of, they're, they're excellent, but they're extra, right? Very true, very true. Uh, last couple of questions, Sanjay. Uh, interesting idea about never decrypting your data and only sharing answers. What I was wondering, is it provably secure? Because naively, I would think, the more questions I can ask you, and you tell me the answers, so in, the inf in the regime of large number of questions, do we still retain privacy, or privacy so starts getting limited? Yeah. Exposure. Uh, so the the um, first of all, provably is probably not what you want to strive for. It's a practical standard, okay? And and the reason that's important is is that as you get continual updating of the data and migration of questions, most of the formal proofs fall away, okay? So what you're looking for is something where it's just very difficult. So. In the system I described, all of the communications are encrypted. And you're saying, well, what would happen if I got a bunch of people to conspire to ask questions? Well, remember that you get to see all of the questions. And so one of the things that we've done is we build some tools to ask, is this a suspicious set of questions that have been asked? Right? So you can ask about how much has been revealed by monitoring what's going on. And you need to modulate it by how much the actual database is changing. Like, you might have a suspicious number of questions, but if it's about a very quickly changing thing, it doesn't matter. So, so they find out an answer from a long time ago. Big deal, right? Peter. Yep. And then you're next, Bobby. Uh, I wondered whether, in terms of number of connections or diversity index, uh, the higher that is, the more impact you have. But are there optimal substructures? I mean, there are studies of optimal size of teams to interact, because otherwise you get bothered by the complexity of the interactions. So that's size. But maybe also in diversity, are there substructures in diversity? Is there an optimum maybe that first you work with a team of similar culture? And then you broaden out in substructures. Is, is, is there some? So if you remember the, the slide I said about Chinese startups, um, diversity was a huge factor for the company getting started and funded, right? But it was a negative, not a mm. negative, but a much less factor when they were talking about operations and scaling. And so what we see when we 
look at actual work groups is we tend to see an oscillation. So people get together and talk among themselves. That's not terribly, I mean, it's good to have a diverse team, but it's the same people day after day, right? And then they go out and they talk to very diverse people, right? So you get a little bit of both. I liken it to um, uh, you're, you're foraging for new ideas, new perspectives. You bring them back, you sort it through up. them, you yeah. pick the good ones, you develop it. That tells you the next thing you're out to look for and you go out and look for it. Um, and in the things that we've looked at, that process is a very quick process. It may happen you know, once a day, once a week, and just observationally, it needs to be something that's explicitly rewarded. So for instance, if you know, when you have a group meeting, you, know, you say, okay, who has something new for us that we can debate and maybe learn from, and you give them a gold star for that, and you know, whatever. Um, you need to actually recognize that somebody did the work of going out and finding something new and uh, proposing something that maybe sounds crazy but turns out to be good. So they're ris risking you know, their reputation as a serious scientist right, or something by bringing back crazy stuff. And uh, that sort of iteration seems to be the, the soul of it. So has that got worse over time? Uh, that we do less of, of that risk taking? Because back to my hunter-gatherer thing, so we go back to there, do you think there was, it, risk taking had more credit given then or less credit than it is now? Was it just something we always struggle with and we're just in a particular way because we seem disconnected from each other, it seems the struggle is even harder. But in fact, re in reality, this is the perpetual struggle. Well, I think it's a perpetual structure. I mean, so, you know, all organizations become siloed yeah. and islands, and, and it's a sort of more comfortable We, we make tribes do that. very quickly. We make tribes, and then yeah. we tend to cut ourselves off because, exactly. you know, they're knock, knocking on yeah. the door. It, the studies I've seen of primitive cultures, the sort of things that they debate about is, you know, where do you go this way to find new food or that yeah. sort of way, yeah. right? And that's an important choice for them because they haven't got a lot of resources, and if you make the wrong choice, bad things happen. Um, but they make that through discussion, and, and people go off and explore and say, yeah. hey, I saw this you great You can't area. know the answer. You had no map. You didn't know what was there. Someone had to go. So people go out and look yeah. around and so forth. And, and the thing, as I point out in my book, but other people certainly, you know, most social species do this. Bees famously do this. They go out and search for places with lots of flowers, come back. Their enthusiasm level uh, provokes other bees to go out and explore the same area and confirm it, right? And then when you get a certain and amount and of so enthusiasm. There's a, there is a pheromonal trail they leave from the Feynman work that is nicer for other ants to go and follow. Ants do it that way, that's yeah, exactly. right. Yeah. So, but bees, there's a reward bees do it by their little dance. Yep, and right? ants, it's, you follow the trail Apes and it smells do good. it by hooting and, yeah. and other sort of displays. Of, I'm going to start people. that in my team meeting. You like should, it I, works, yeah. I'll tell you. Hooting, yeah. Every time I start hooting, they pay attention. <laughs> yeah. Okay, last question. This, is, this could go on forever, it's a lot of fun. As a, fine, a fan of knowledge, uh, I'm wondering if mobility might not be a measure of the inability to hold a job. Sure, it has something to do with that. Um, you know, so, so this is a national database, and uh, I hopefully, I could go back and check, the way it was done was um, when you lose a job, how quickly can you find another job, right? So that it's not, you know, how valuable were you? Um, it's uh, how, built, how, uh, how adaptable are you? I'd have to go back and check it. But it's striking to me still that these social things, uh, which are the ability to work with other people, right? The ability to sort of harvest uh, other ideas uh, seems to be such a big thing, and we don't teach it at all. The big theme is, is that the way we think of ourselves, the way we instruct people, the way we reward people is almost exclusively as individuals. But in fact, a lot of the knowledge we have, the expertise, 
the development of successful ways of operating require coordinating with other people and observing what they're doing and bringing that back. And we don't teach it. We don't reward it. We don't structure for that. Um, so it's not to denigrate the individual. It's just to say that's 50% of the story, not 100% of the story. I would just round that out, I think, by saying, and the digital world makes it easier to avoid it. That's right. Because we're out of practice of, of the value that we used to get. So, Do you so agree? People, people are very confused about that point. So let me just So people say, well, but gee, there's all this information online. But if you look at um, how often you actually change your behavior as a function of things you read online, the answer is very little. Very little. And particularly if you're talking about work things or something like that. Um, you have to reach some sort of a, you know, accommodation with the world around you, which means working with the people around you. Uh, if they validate it, you're much more likely to do that. So for instance, you can read about an app, right? You say, oh, that could be interesting. But if you see two of the people you hang out with using it, using it you are far more likely to actually do which it. Which you can't communicate across a digital Realm, you don't see them in their in their native behaviors, right? So right, and great. and and you don't know exactly who they are. I mean, studies of this show, you know, that your likelihood of adopting things as a function of that sort of uh, learning from people like you that you physically interact with is tens of times greater than the likelihood of you adopting something because you just read about it. What a great, oh, Todd, you're insisting. We have 18 seconds for so both the question minutes. and the answer. Very, so very quickly, <laughs> just to, to amplify the, the point, I read a recent piece of lamenting democracy and leadership and, and the bifurcation that we see in our country. And um, a, a lot of what they're, what they're indicating is that we've moved from these physical communities to these electronic communities. And so in addition to the communities affecting us, one of the things that they were arguing is that if you're in a physical community, you feel as though your voice can be heard and that people can hear you and hear your arguments, whereas in electronic, it's less so. Uh, and, and so it, it's not only uh, in informing people in, in interacting with people and, and you, but also your ability to be part of democracy, be part of the country, oh, not an observer, but an active participant in democracy. Feel valued, yeah, absolutely. It was the quick answer because your question took the 18 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay, thanks very much, and it was fantastic stuff. I get to give you a statue now. Ooh. This Hopefully, it's the best uh, statue you've ever received uh, before, wow. before the Nobel. OK, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's uh, the Shannon Award for a fantastic lecture. Thanks so much. OK. <laughs>